This issue of Fashion Classics explores the many faces of British fashion for Autumn Winter 2006. Giles Deacon mixes things up. We really wanted to have a, um, a bit of a complete change. Throw it all up in the air and see what came down. Paul Smith introduces a new label for women called Men Only. Because so many of the girls love what I do for men. Basso and Brooke cook up a visually powerful collection. Basso and Brooke was very exuberant and very London. Plus, New York City celebrates British style with the Anglomania exhibit. It's an opportunity to celebrate something which isn't just about wearing clothes, it's about so many things. At their winter show, Basso and Brooke pumped up the glamour. They asked me to create a very kind of glamorous, airbrush looking, expensive, um, but modern in a way, in a sense that we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want the makeup, even though it's quite vampy, to go in any direction of any era. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very glamorous, very pump, very expensive, very um, naughty. We were trying to introduce elements of colour into the hair and they kind of liked a lot of the sort of acid, kind of sort of punky cyber feel. But um, the Basso and Brooke woman is, um, I suppose it's where um, the Victorian period meets cyber space. The references for the colour have come from the colour palette of the collection. So what we've used is more acid colours, so it's like reds or vibrant oranges, greens and stuff like that. And the texture from the hair is basically about just trying the hair to have some kind of a, like a little bit of an unkemptness to it, but still having some sexiness to it. That feeling of sexiness was enhanced at Showtime with a highly dramatic presentation, a Basso and Brooke signature. You know, we, we're trying to put on, we're going to put on a quite a theatrical show. I think it's nice, and this is this is so London. This kind of, you know, and, and it's somewhere that not people, many people have been. You know, it's underneath London Bridge Station. And this, you know, it used to be this kind of stables where, in Victorian times, where they used to keep all the horses. So it's really exciting that people can get to see this this kind of venue right next to the underground station. You know, you come out of the underground station, you go through a little door. It's kind of like being John Mankiewicz. You know, it's, you enter this other world. You're going to be seeing um, Basso and Brook in a more sombre mood, I think. Um, we're always, we're very no, we're known for kind of overloading people with information. Last season was very cartoon and very camp, very dramatic. It's, this season again, it's very dramatic, but in a very in a much in a more different way. The inspiration for the prints is all about kind of new discoveries. So it's all about. Um, People in their time being kind of misunderstood, um, like uh, Galileo and um, Leonardo da Vinci, all these kind of people that, that society thought were a bit crazy, but you know, in fact, were, were much far ahead of their time. I loved um, Basso and Brooke last night. I just think they're prints. Are quite extraordinary. The, the one uh, print that they used last night was um, a mixture of Fragonard and Manet with spacemen and aliens all kind of mixed together. And I thought it was very, very dramatic. I like to work a lot on um, pattern cutting the, the shapes. Bruno's, Bruno's a graphic designer, so he's, he concentrates on the prints. But I always like to experiment with the shapes and using very... I like things to look complicated but they're actually maybe a square, a fabric. Like it's how you fold it or how you stitch it that, that gives it the, the intro. Basso and Brooke was very exuberant and very London, which was really fun, of course. I'm always nervous because you know what fashion's like, so you never know what's going to happen. But we're happy with it. Um, we don't, we, we're going to be sometimes in, in fashion, sometimes out of fashion, but 
as long as we just continue being happy with what we're doing, then that's all that matters to us, really. The fans piled in for Giles Deacon's winter show. Oh, well, he made this beautiful gown for me that I wore for the Harpers and Queen photo shoot. It was really beautiful, and ever since I wore that, I was a big fan, and I'm anxious to see his show. Deacon sent out a parade of looks with a distinctly artistic feel. This bold departure won him the British Fashion Awards Designer of the Year. We really wanted to have a, um, a bit of a complete change, throw it all up in the air and see what came down. So we really, we just really wanted to do something really modern, clean, super bright colours, really good fun, sharp, just you know, have a, see what we could do with that. I went to the, um, the Ellsworth Kelly exhibition um, at the Tate St Ives and it just that blew me away and it kind of just got me reading into some of his like, work and philosophies and things and it just, just sort of went on my own little, um, little journey with it and that's what came out. I very much enjoyed the preview I had of Charles Deacon show. A lot of Ellsworth Kelly inspired prints. I mean, they were all hand drawn and then super blown up and then really messed around with the gold foil and that giant leopard that was kind of checking in on it itself, kind of looking like a mad owl. I loved that one. I thought that was really great. Something really great about huge outsized leopards and things like that. He can also put a modern spin on his knitwear. They were all, all, all like foil transferred, so we got like this, this roving wool, which is like huge thick yarn, and then put these foil sheets, and then you peel it off, and to get these really mad, they almost look like um, insulation for your, for your loft or something, but they, 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 they look quite fantastic. A simpler approach was used with leather. I mean, we just really like the, the, the clean lines. If you get it right with leather, there's nothing better with a simple thing to do than that. And the, the, we call it the razor dress, that one, and it works a treat, I think. I mean, it was really different. It was really radical, and um, but there was um, there was so much dare in that show that I, after I see that, I really know. Okay, that's what I've sort of been missing in a way. The quality and the execution of the individual pieces is really quite beautiful. So it's really nice to see that, you know, like it's really nice to see couture quality. And I think to be something and today you have to be really strong. So I, I, I'm happy. I mean, things are changing in, the, in that they change very quickly, which is a, sometimes a thing to keep up with in itself. But with, you know, things are going really well in America and the Far East, and, and the business is going, you know, well in a manageable manner. So we're, we're just trying to keep it all together, really. In a season where a return to tailoring is shaping up to be a strong trend, Sir Paul Smith has taken the idea one step further. Well, we've got a, a new element to, to my collection, which is called Men Only, and the, the, the label actually says Men Only. And I think people will be really pleased with that because um, so many of the girls keep saying, oh, I love my boyfriend's coats, but why can't I have one? A lot of polka dots, um, uh, a lot of, um, you can see here as well, polka dot, polka dot. Uh, the catwalk is a circle, so um, I'm emphasising the idea of a masculine sort of prints like polka dots. Um, taking the inspiration probably a lot from the era of uh, Catherine Hepburn, um, so I suppose you'd say late 30s, early 1940s, hint, but only a hint, but always with these opposites, so mixed with you know, masculine shoes or mixed with uh, maybe feminine, masculine, or very Paul Smith. The beauty look echoed the masculine-feminine mix. The look, really, I suppose, is kind of Janis Joplin meets Lauren Bacall. Uh, there's like, kind of like, quite a hard kind of side parting that's quite sleek, and it literally just comes across the front of the forehead. And then there's this kind of like really beautiful kind of 
I suppose, bohemian kind of texture. So it's really a combination of something very kind of like quite masculine and something really feminine and beautiful and free. We've got um, uh, coats that uh, are very classical, but then we've got coats that just wrap around and tie. We've got double face, you know, where you've got herringbone on one side and polka dots on the other. And then we've also got um, like lots of uh, just little, simple little uh, jackets, just very elegant little jackets. And I like those uh, over, like over a dress or over a, a skirt and, and blouse, so very cropped and very small. And I've got some jackets which look like boys' jackets, um, uh, simple final. things like this, which is just just um, taking a boys' jacket, but but doing gathers into it to give it a slightly more unusual feel to it, um, which is very nice. And then uh, a coat as well with uh, with the gathers on the back for outerwear. So it looks really like a boys' coat, but it's got these all this interesting detail on it. It's an incredibly uh, easy to wear collection and uh, I think a lot of people will be very pleased with the fact that it's got the, the men only section. Opposites. So I think what people will feel is that the clothes are very easy to wear. Backstage at Aquascutum, beauty teams worked on an elegant and youthful look. There's two looks. There's a very sort of pale, ethereal, sort of porcelain beige um, on the girls. What we're doing this season is we're using blush, like two tones of blush. It's just that kind of like young, flushed virgin. And next to her is the vamp. She's also young, but she's learned to put on red lipstick. So there's this very, 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 very strong stained red lip with a, a, a bright red highlight. Basically what we're doing is a, a small kind of uh, pulled back um, shingyong in a really kind of modern way. Um, the inspiration came from um, the clothes, which the silhouettes are a little bit 50s or 60s. But um, it's done in a really kind of, it's not too retro, it's a m kind of more modern way. Um, almost like Twiggy in the, the 60s, so it's a little bit boyish on the side parting, pulled back into a ponytail at the nape, and just looped over into a really, really easy kind of shingyong at the back. The design duo behind Aquascutum have been transporting the 155-year-old label into the 21st century, earning stellar reviews all the while. The collection and the, the season began uh, where we left off last season, you know, we've been given this opportunity to, to revive a, an old British brand, as it were, and I think we're doing a mighty fine job, if I do say so ourselves. Um, but, you know, at, at the same time, it's, it's always necessary to, to, to tap into different things. The season began by looking at Dolly, looking at, um, you know, the, the whole part of our initial concept when we began the collection was mixing the materials, um, it was about developing shapes three-dimensionally as opposed to two-dimensionally. And what we found was it was quite nice to work on the fabrics from a two-dimensional and three-dimensional point of view also. So the surreal, the surreal aspect sort of came in um, from the, the, the Dolly inspiration, from other areas, other, other film. A portion of the garments as well. Yeah. A portion of the garments and the way we put the colours together. I thought what they're doing with the traditional aquascutum raincoat is great. You know, I thought that that was uh, all the coats were really strong and updated and, and young. And I would have thought, you know, giving a whole new uh, life to that, you know, very traditional house. So I was really, really impressed with the coats for both for both men and women. We did lots of work on taking the raincoat apart and then re-putting it back in different way. So you had elements like the bib pieces that could be worn with the coat it was originally taken from or worn separately with the dress as a little capelet or something. 
Aquascutum was was beautiful, very assured, very charming, and just sort of whimsical enough, but still within the framework of a, a sort of establishment brand like that. It's really very good, uh, I mean, really positive, lots of editorial, lots of support in the industry. Anna Wintour is massively supporting the situation yeah, at the great. moment, as very well as Sarah Moore, yeah. as well as the British contingency. But I think it's, it's important for us to keep mouldering on and given the opportunity to do the next season, I think we'll, we'll uh, come up trumps and begin to, make a, <laughs> begin to make a bigger and better statement as the seasons progress. Gareth is the sort of mad boy, isn't he? He's this season's mad boy. Newcomer Gareth Pugh has been creating a buzz on the London fashion scene, and with just a look at his winter show, one can see why. It's just that idea of kind of wearing like this amazing kind of massive, incredibly expensive piece of jewellery, but it actually looks quite tacky and cheap, and then actually kind of becoming that thing. So that's kind of why you've got the poodle. It kind of turns into this kind of, kind of very cheap pop throwaway kind of thing, which is like a balloon poodle you get at a kids' party. But it's like this, it's kind of been like not immortalised, but it's kind of been made more permanent and more precious in a way um, by being made into kind of a, a kind of costume creature person. We just learn as we go along, because I mean, all the people who I work with are just like people who. Like me, you're kind of just trying to kind of do interesting things, but not really sure how to do them. And I haven't got any money to pay like technicians or pattern cutters, so just kind of muddle through, which is why a lot of things take a lot of time. Like that's been, no, it's been like three months of my life in five minutes. It's like, it's a, it's very odd. I think you know, somewhere inside his brain, there's a very good designer, which will emerge eventually. I think for now, he's only 24 and he wants to experiment, he wants to be outrageous, sort of in much the same way Alexander McQueen did when he first did shows. And I think Gareth's main aim at the moment is to get people talking about him and obviously to get more money and more backing so he can do a real fabulous wearable collection, not kind of blow up poodle suits and bunny suits. I'm just grateful for people who appreciate what I do. I mean, I don't kind of feel what I do is at all different to what anybody else would do if they're in my situation, but I just feel very lucky that I've actually been given the opportunity to do something. Um, and it is kind of like what I've always wanted to do, so it's kind of, I feel very privileged. <laughs> I always like to make people laugh or kind of smile. So it's like, if that happened, if just for a little second, then I've achieved my goal. The British are coming, they're here. In New York, both Hollywood and fashion's most glamorous were on hand at the Metropolitan Museum of Art to celebrate British fashion. Bravery, intelligence, and a sense of humor. David Bowie, the Beatles, the Stones. British people have always rocked my world. They sort of have a respect for tradition. And yet, there's always a twist. There's always something a little off, or something a little naughty, or humorous. Anglomania, tradition and transgression in British fashion, explores the ideals and stereotypes of Englishness, and pairs historical costume with modern designs in the museum's English period rooms. We wanted to focus on that particular ideas of Englishness, and we walked through the rooms and it became clear quite early on that the rooms themselves held the idea of Englishness in the actual very fabric of them. In each particular room there's an element of the past, an element of the present, an element of tradition, an element of transgression. The first room is based on the idea of the English country garden. There's a wonderful dress by Hussein Shalayan, uh, which almost looks like a, a form of human topiary. It's, um, he's, he's created hundreds and hundreds of rosettes, stitched them onto a canvas base, then clipped them away to look like topiary. Andrew Bolton wanted them because he felt, because it was all about layers of history being cut away, and he, he sort of felt it fitted in with, his, with the concept. I think the 
um, exhibition has captured that kind of mad irreverence in a f fantastic way and you really get a sense of the energy, the creative energy that, um, that London's produced in sort of fashion design terms as well as kind of the, the elegance of Savile Row and the tailoring tradition and the sort of grand ball gown. I mean, we have a room which is based uh, on Franco Mania. So we have a wonderful um, dual gown by John Galliano, which focuses on this idea of Franco Mania. John's a great Francophile, and the gown actually conflates the his references from the history of fashion from references from the history of Dior. Always, 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 that we thought it was very sort of bird like and crow like, so it was great to make it the reality. There are a lot of things in this exhibition that are current, you know, that are made in 2006. Uh, it's a constant question of when you all look at Burberry, you know, with the kind of foxy fur attached to the trench coat. It's always about updating the past and making it relevant to now. To celebrate their 150th anniversary, British label Burberry were the main underwriters of the exhibit. You know, very much a part of my work is this contrast and these contradictions of this very sartorial and traditional side of design, but contrasted with something slightly a little bit rebellious sometimes, a little bit kind of part, talking about the different subcultures and musical cultures that exist within England. So the whole, the whole idea of this collaboration was, was, was perfect and, and, and very expressive about who we are and, and what we're doing as well. This room is the Gentleman's Club, um, so we wanted to focus particularly on menswear and have Savile Row suits, which is the pinnacle of the establishment of tradition pitched against the opposite, which is um, punks. The idea of tradition and transgression is quite implicit throughout the show, and by the time you get to the Gentleman's Club, it becomes explicit. See this jacket here? This is part of a suit that I designed with Vivian Westwood for, uh, and she made it for me a long, long time ago. I wore this on the very first Sex Pistols tour of America. Unfortunately, only the jackets left. The pants just fell apart, and so I thought it'd be a nice addition. I don't really look what any other people do too much, and I, I am the one that um, that cuts cuts through. That you know that knocks the door down that goes goes ahead. I think it's this eclectic mixing of styles that epitomizes English culture and also the transgressive aspect of it. Um, uh, it's, it's very theatrical, it's very spectacle based, but often um, it's, um, a sub it's subverting existing rules and regulations and I think uh, because there's such a rigid class system in Britain. I think often this reaction against this class system or the establishment is often where British creativity lies.